<laughs> okay. Hey, that's better. How are you doing? <laughs> doing great. Oh, you're getting worse than me when the white hair. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> How are your children? I mean, they're grown up. I you know the, the importance of you. The... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I remember. <laughs> I... Yeah. yeah, I remember when you wanted to leave or to stay and didn't know what to do. <laughs> I'm so glad you stay there at OU and see your people grow. And uh, how's your wife doing? A great, great, great. <laughs> okay, and it. Hey, you need to get your. So, so I will be back in about in about twenty minutes. I guess. In about twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. So the all right. Now you're back. Now we can hear you again. Okay. Oh. Very good. Okay. Let's see, you can hear me, great. Well, thank you everyone for making it to the Edwards Accelerator Lab uh, 50th birthday party. So I'm Zach Meisel, I'm the current uh, director of the Ed Edwards Accelerator Lab. As you can see, we have many current and past members of the lab and people in the lab's orbit here and really looking forward to, to this event. Uh, to welcome us, we first have the executive vice president and provost, Elizabeth Sayers, so please. Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for inviting me to join you for the 50th uh, anniversary or birthday? Is it a birthday party? Anniversary. It's a party, a birthday party. Since 1971, the Edwards Accelerator Lab has served as a vibrant hub for nuclear physics research, supporting important contributions to the study of nuclear structure, nuclear astrophysics, and nuclear applications such as medical physics, as well as to material sciences and engineering. The work done in the Edwards Lab has been groundbreaking and truly awe-inspiring to consider all of the different research projects that have been conducted in the last 50 years. And while the Edwards Lab is now 50 years old, a half a century, it is constantly evolving and adopting the latest technology. Most recently, the facility added a $250,000 state-of-the-art ion source 
that is being used to study nuclear reactions that produce the elements in stars and play important roles in nuclear applications. And I have to admit, as someone who is a non-scientist, I tried really hard. I went and I read the article about all the equipment in the lab, and what I really wanted to do was work in casually the word duoplasmatron uh, into this talk, but I could not figure out how to do it. Which if you noticed, I just did, so I'm just gonna point that out too. <laughs> The research work conducted by the Edwards Lab, I should also add, is supported by more than a million dollars worth of external grants from federal agencies every year. We as an institution are really thrilled with the success of the laboratory and even prouder of the outstanding faculty, staff, and students, as well as the research colleagues from around the world who have worked in the lab over the last 50 years. I'm really pleased to see many of you with us this weekend for the celebration, but also online. The Edwards Lab has been critical to the type of doctoral education that pushes the boundaries of knowledge. Since 1971, more than three dozen Ohio University PhDs have been awarded based on research that doctoral students have completed as part of the lab. In addition, Ohio University is one of just five universities in the nation where students use the accelerator as part of a nuclear physics laboratory course at the undergraduate level. And it's not just PhD students, right? Graduate students, undergraduate students, they're all choosing to come and work and do their research at Ohio University because of the unique opportunities offered, offered at the lab. And our alumni will tell you that these lessons learned here and the research work that they've had the opportunity to do here have helped them greatly, not only in their scientific endeavors, but in their careers. The Edwards Lab also attracts researchers from around the world who come here to use this facility, often bolstered uh, over the last 30 years by the truly collaborative environment of the Institute of Nuclear and Particle Physics. In the last decade alone, researchers from more than 15 institutions in the US and Europe have come here to use this outstanding facility. So in addition to creating opportunities for research, the laboratory also helps to create and maintain important and long-lasting connections with colleagues and universities around the world, which provides countless benefits that last for our students, for our faculty, and for the scientific community at large. I want to close by acknowledging the outstanding work of our faculty and staff who support and run the Edwards Accelerator Laboratory. I'm grateful to them for all that has been accomplished here in the last 50 years, and I look forward to seeing the impact the Edwards Accelerator Laboratory will continue to make in the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Provost Sayers, for those very nice remarks. Uh, to further welcome us, we have the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Florence uh, Plasman. Thank you, Dean Plasman. Um, what the provost just said. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll, I'll say a little bit more. So thanks very much for inviting me to speak at the opening of Edwards 50. Um, we all look at the Edwards Accelerator Lab as a great facility for important research in nuclear physics, and it certainly is. Um, but I think we should also view Edwards Accelerator Lab as a prime example of long-term investment that has paid off. And if you think about it, it has all the key ingredients for success. So first, the project or originated from a faculty initiative. So professors Roger Finlay and Ray Lane um, applied for and received the initial $1 million grant from the Atomic Energy Commission that funded the accelerator in 1967. So every success story starts with somebody's dream and with somebody's willingness to put in the long hours to get the project off the ground. Second, the Accelerator Lab was maintained through faculty foresight. Um, most universities closed down their accelerators 20 or 30 years ago, um, but the Ohio University physics faculty continued to upgrade, modernize, and expand the accelerator over the next um, 50 years, most, certain, most recently in 2020, with the new alpha truss source. This was my way of putting it a technical term. 
So there's always the temptation <clears throat> to call it quits when times get tough and budgets get tight. And we need the visionaries who recognize what can be and who find creative ways to continue the work. At this point, the Edwards Accelerator Lab is clearly one of the key laboratories for neutron beams, evidenced by the fact that researchers from all over the United States and from Europe travel to Athens to undertake their projects here. Third, Ohio University has recognized the importance of the Accelerator Lab and provided extensive support over the years. Yes, it's true, the Department of Energy and NSF funded the Accelerator and many of the upgrades, but over the years, Ohio University has provided substantial internal funds as well. Um, the university helped constructing the time of flight tunnel in 1980 and expanded uh, the bu uh, building in 1994. And in 2004, it identified and supported nuclear and astrophysics as a major re research priority. Uh, Long-term success clearly requires that the university has buy-in and supports the project. But fourth, and most importantly, uh, the laboratory provides outstanding research opportunities for our students. By my count, and I also came across the three dozen, but then I decided to go for the longer list, there have been about 100 PhD graduates in experimental nuclear science uh, at Ohio University during the last 50 years. So that's about two per year, including 24 students in the past 10 years. And the lab setup provides our students with exactly the hands-on experience that they wouldn't get elsewhere and that gives them a head start in their careers. So the close involvement of students, graduates and undergraduate students, is essential for projects to remain relevant over time. So here we have four key ingredients for success. A faculty-driven project, faculty that, that faculty have carefully maintained that's recognized and valued by the university and that continues to provide outstanding research and learning opportunities for faculty and students at Ohio University and beyond. So that's what we want. And we need more such long-term investments that pay off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree more with that. So very much appreciated. So now we have some, uh, we move on to remarks from uh, people from the Edwards Accelerator past, some key figures that Florence mentioned. So we have some remarks from Chuck Bryant. So please take it away, Chuck. I, sh I should just say ditto and let it go with that. But what I wanted to do is to mention three events and, th two, and three surprises. The events that we want to look at are somewhat humorous and yet meaningful. And the ones that I, in particular, want to start out with a description of the neutron lab, which was sitting on the corner over here next to the circle of driver decisions. This was a project of Roger Finley, in which, whom we wish was here to celebrate with us. The uh, event that he mentioned was in fact that an administrator had come to the laboratory to see what was going on in this laboratory. And he was standing behind the the brick wall and Roger was running the machine so that he could actually see what was happening. He stood close to the wall, stuck his head stuff around the wall, folded his arms and said, I don't see him. <laughs> the invisible neutrons. The next event which I would mention is the liftoff of the Cessna two-engine plane from the university airport, which was commanded by the President Vernon Alden. And he was on his way, in fact, to Washington, D.C. And he had taken with him four of the faculty, I believe, maybe 
it was Dick Koshel and Jerry Adams, I'm not sure. There was some discussion about whether we could take somebody without a, an American citizenship, but I think that got set aside. The uh, plane lifted off about where Kroger or Walmart are and was headed for the Washington, D.C. to tell the people at the AEC, we thought it should be NEC, of course, but they told the we were, President Alden was telling them that he was ready to support the nuclear program and the building of the accelerator project. And he assured them that that's what he wanted. Well, that $1 million, which we proposed, was funded. And so we did exactly what we wanted. The next event that I recall was where we were called by the trucker who was hauling a tandem vessel, a burnt orange tandem vessel around Athens. He could not find the laboratory because it was at the dead end of Race Street, and he didn't know where it was. So we had to chase him down to get him to bring the vessel to the lab. And the picture you saw when you signed up for this event was the picture of this bird orange tank sitting on the steps on the entry to the laboratory. Then we had three surprises. The surprises were the thing would not go through the door to the vault. We couldn't get it through the door because of the top flange was taller than the ceiling above it. And above it was a four foot bit of high density concrete. Well, we had Dave Sturboyce who knew the local people and was able to come up with a name for somebody with a jackhammer who could go through and chip a four foot section of channel so we could roll the uh, tank into the vault. So the vault. The next surprise came when we realized that we could not shine the laser up through the tandem and, and had to find a place to put the laser which would allow us to leave it in one place as, as a steady tool to align the beam. And when we finally realized that we the only steady place was the wall, which was at 90 degrees to the beam. And we couldn't figure out exactly what to do, except we knew we had to change the direction of the laser beam by 90 degrees. So we used a pentaprism. Where would you get a pentaprism? Something that's not ordinarily sitting on a shelf. Well, you called Army Wrist, and the Army Wrist, who had everything involved from vacuum tubes uh, to optical devices, was able to pull up a pentaprism. So we mounted this prism, pentaprism on the wall, going between the large target room and the accelerator vault. What we wanted to do was, of course, be able to produce time of flight spectra. And I believe it was one of Steve Grimes' students, Narayan, who was demonstrating that the flight path from the target, from the swinger magnet to the end of the tunnel 
was 30 meters, and he was taking a spectrum from 3 meters to 30 meters. And we were amazed to see how this spectrum came about to look like a charged particle spectrum. Very, very dramatic. The reason, of course, was because we had Don Carter who could use, provide the technology for timing the beam. So the, the point to be made was this was a accelerator which was to be high intensity. And in order to be a high intensity accelerator, we had to produce large beams in the, in the big target room. The, the problem was that when we t looked at the optics, it was not going to happen. So we had to learn lawyer language to talk to high voltage engineering and to convince them that they needed to provide us an additional quadrupole after the bending magnet in order, in order to get the beam in there. We provided 50, nano, 50 microamps at 5 million volt terminal and made the specs there. We provided 100 microamps at 4.5 MV terminal. And so began the long and colorful things that you're about to hear from our friend Jack Rappaport and others. Jack, we miss you and Irma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck, for those nice uh, memories. And we're very glad that you guys were able to chase down the accelerator on Race Street. Otherwise, history would have been pretty different. <laughs> so for the next uh, part of this meeting, we have Daniel Phillips is going to interview Jack Rappaport. So please take it away, Daniel. Good afternoon. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to be uh, here at the celebration of 50 years of the Edwards Accelerator Lab. Uh, um, my day job is as a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, but today I'm going to moonlight as an interviewer. Um, and uh, as already mentioned, Jack Rappaport, who, who joined the faculty here in 1969, um, is going to tell us uh, uh, some of his history about coming to Ohio University and uh, some of the adventures of the early years. Jack, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, very good. So, so everyone say hi to Jack. Hi, Jack. Hello, 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 everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Jack, I understand that this was not the uh, not your not your first uh, involvement with a with a tandem accelerator. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. <laughs> uh, let me say a few words before we start uh, the, the, the talking to each other. Uh, I would like first of all to to thank uh, Chuck uh, for the beautiful introduction he gave of what we did at the time. Uh, it brings back uh, so many happy and fulfilling times. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here, uh, eventually, even if virtually, uh, to participate in the celebration of our 50th anniversary of the tandem Fantagraph at Ohio University. It is half a century. It seems only to me that I was yesterday that I joined the faculty to participate in the start of the research in our new Fantagraph and to teach physics, both of which had been the ambition of my life. Only a few months ago, with my wife Irma, we were making plans uh, to travel to Athens and renew the irrepressible person-to-person -person contact with so many of our old friends, to visit them. But, but uh, as my physician told me, life happens. And unfortunately, we had to cancel our plans to go there. However, Zoom uh, gave me the opportunity to be virtually with all of you in this beautiful celebration. For over 30 years, the OU Nuclear Physics Group, now IMPP, the OU Physics Department, and OU in general 
were a large part of my life. We saw our children grow in beautiful Athens, become teenagers, go to college, complete professional careers, and get married. Those happy and beautiful years will be in our memory forever. I saw our department grow to faculty of 24, 25 members, then decrease to a lower number because of lack of student enrollment. And then it was in the 70s, and then solidify again and grow slowly to where we are now. I am proud to be part of that united group of faculty that has took the ups and downs of those hard times. As was mentioned, I joined the faculty in the fall of 69, one year after the being in Oak Ridge with the nuclear data group, and three years as, as, as an assistant professor at MIT. During my time uh, in Oak Ridge National Lab, I had the pleasure to meet for the first time Chuck Bryant and Harolyn Bryant, who have been our very few members that, that were at, at that time and, and, and friends of ours that have been friends for all our life. I think for Chuck, his visit with Harolyn to Oak Ridge brings good memories, especially because of his youngest son. Well, I am delighted here to be with you and join you in the celebration. Thanks, Jack. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about um, uh, your time in Chile before you came to MIT. Um, the, I'm sorry? Working the, on the accelerator in Chile before you came to oh, MIT. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We essentially, uh, I was at the faculty, uh, the physics department, newly physics department at the Ohio, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, at the University of Chile in Santiago, Chile. Uh, we were uh, a group of 10, maybe eight to 10 physicists that wanted to do nuclear physics. Uh, we, the rector of the university uh, really was very much interested and he's the one who induced us to study physics instead of engineering. Uh, he, uh, I came to MIT, and the reason I came to MIT because we had in mind at the time to buy a fan for Chile. Uh, MIT uh, is in Boston, and the, fa and the factory that made uh, the, those fan at the time was in, uh, in, in, in that area. So I had a time to visit and know the, the people working there and to work with some of them uh, in, 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 in the design of the machine. So I had some experience with them there. Unfortunately, when I went back to Chile after getting my PhD at MIT, uh, the faculty, uh, the, there was, a, a, I should say, a, a change in the administration. Uh, what we call uh, in South America, the rector, which is essentially the president of the university, at that time uh, changed and the new president decided not to continue nuclear physics and to spend, uh, I guess, something like $400,000 at the time for which we had a grant to uh, give uh, to a group of eight physicists to do essentially to play with the machine. He felt at the time that the, that money could be used for medical studies and essentially to a hospital. Of course, that never happened. And uh, at that time he told me, I think you should continue your research in nuclear physics, which was my aim, uh, somewhere else. I came to MIT again, for, and I, I stayed there and the faculty for three years. Yes, so I knew I had some experience with fantagraphs, and I, I was at MIT with the, with the nuclear physics group working with their tandem. And so then, uh, at let me share my screen here. Oh, that's okay. We're gonna have to do this. So let me. So then, uh, I think we talked about this picture when I talked to you the other day. So this picture we think was taken <laughs> in 1968 yes. or 1969. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, that so picture you essentially. Not, you are not in this picture, right? No, I'm not in that picture. The picture was taken in. Uh, uh, a year earlier uh, to my arrival. You can see there the faculty at that time in nuclear physics, 
were Ray Lane, who just came in uh, a few years earlier, uh, Roger Finlay, uh, and David only in the middle, and Chuck Bryant on the other side. On the two extremes, there were our only theoretical physicists at, at that time, which uh, were uh, uh, Richard Koschel and Jerry Adams. That was the theoretical faculty in nuclear physics the, and with David only. There were three nuclear physicists, as you showed them there, and I, I joined them. This was our first group. Unfortunately, Ray Lane, who was the, really the, the architect and the one who brought the machine, and he came from Argonne and wanted to do neutron physics, uh, is not with us anymore, neither Roger Finley. So, Chuck, we're the only ones that can talk about the history of our tandem. So, and I think here is the, this is, yeah. the, this is trying to fit the, the thing yeah. to the door, right? <laughs> that is uh, either uh, the late uh, 69 or the beginning of 1970, where you see the main part of the accelerator coming into the building. As you can see, <laughs> it looks like a submarine. And we painted, and we decided to paint it at that time, sort of a yellowish color, uh, because uh, with the Beatles, we had the yellow submarine. So essentially, <laughs> that was a nickname that we gave our machine at that time. Roy Finley is in front of it uh, with the pipe, as you can see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, as we know, the, the tandem is a T type of machine uh, where the vertical uh, section, which is the, the tank is in there, uh, is being lowered down to the to the to the, to, to the present place uh, uh, is uh, going to be located. Is uh, was again uh, in, inside the building and going into that pit. So, so this had happened before you arrived. Then all this stuff. I was... think that happened. At the, I, may, I may have been there. Honestly, I don't remember. Okay. But uh, essentially, it was. The late '69 or, or the beginning of 1970. Okay, and you had been sort of recruited from Oak Ridge to come and contribute to the yeah, program. Yeah, exactly. I arrived there in the September '69. Okay. So actually, we will do that one later. So, so then, so I, you told me when we talked the other day that uh, that there was some difficulties, which I think Chuck also alluded to, to getting the machine up to the design specs, right? So you had tr it, you, you couldn't operate it at the full voltage because of issues with uh, arcing in the gas? It, it took some time uh, to get the final spec. The machine is supposed to be 5.5 uh, MeV and uh, tandem. So essentially, we could have reached theoretically 11 MeV. Uh, unfortunately, the machine, uh, which is uh, with a gas, uh, pressurized gas of uh, SF6, I guess, yeah, and uh, it needed really to be real pure gas so that it didn't break. Uh, so the maximum voltage that we achieved during the first year of work and even the second year was something like about 4 MeV. So we did a lot of work with 4 MeV, especially Ray Lane, that they wanted to do neutron work at that energy, which was great for him. We wanted to really go up in energy, and it, it took some time to get to the 5.5 MeV until we signed the papers, uh, the, giving the okay to the company that it could, it could be reached 5.5. Essentially, it, it was a few minutes of work that we reached the 5.5, and we decided at that time to really say, okay. So then in terms of producing high intensity and higher energy beams of neutrons, what was the pathway to that? Yeah. Uh, the idea was to produce neutrons. And essentially, as Chuck mentioned, uh, the running belt that is on the vertical section of the T uh, is a very wide uh, belt. Uh, and uh, it, you can carry a lot of current up there. And uh, it's, uh, you can carry a lot of current up there because we wanted a high intensity proton beam to really uh, 
produce neutrons. Neutrons, as we know, is a secondary particle. So essentially it's hard to produce them. And you can do work with neutrons, but in order to do that work, you need a high intensity beam. And our facility, the idea was to provide a high energy protons to produce the neutrons via a PN reaction, a DDN reactions, or a TDN reactions. And, and that was the whole idea that we had. And it was a beautiful idea that essentially had a ray lane. And looking backwards, uh, I believe that we are our in our 50th year because of we are the only facility that has neutrons uh, for students to work with uh, at, in the US. I may be wrong. I think Duke used to have, I'm not sure their machine is running or not, but uh, uh, there were probably between 60 or 80 or 100 van de Graaffs uh, populated in the different uh, universities here in the state uh, in the 70s, uh, but uh, of them, practically all of them are gone. Uh, and that's the reason, and because the reason that we still are alive is because it was a neutron, high intensity neutron beam machine. Uh, I, I should say that uh, the, 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 of all the machines, uh, this is a unique type of machine. And I understand only one more was built uh, by Van de Graaff people, uh, and the other one went to Athens, Greece. And I never visited that place, but we had uh, friends of ours uh, that doing nuclear physics work uh, that visited our place, and they were from that place in Greece, in Athens. Yes, I'd heard that too. So, so indeed, the the connection uh, is beyond just the the name. Oh yes, because the connection is beyond the name. Uh, we both cities have the same tandem. So then. Um, some time later, I don't. You can tell me how much time later. Uh, you you became a distinguished professor, and you were telling me that you were proud of this photograph. You want to explain your uh, why you think this photograph is unique among distinguished professor photographs? Uh, yes. Uh, essentially, when I got the honor to be on a, a fac oh, sorry, uh, it was in the in the nineties or eighty eighty. Don't recall the exact date, but uh, when I was, I had the honor to be named uh, uh, this uh, distinguished professor. Uh, they decided to take my picture to be in that hallway uh, where I do my work. Uh, I do my work without a tie. In the way you see me there, uh, you see near the swinger, the, uh, another machine that we, uh, another device, I should say, that uh, came from. Michigan State University, and at the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, we had an array of neutrons. Those were liquid detectors to, to look at neutrons, and uh, we could move that, uh, that, that rail uh, between uh, a few meters up to 26 meters on the tunnel. And uh, that picture brings a lot of memory, as I said, because uh, I decided not to wear a tie, because I always very sort of uh, informal uh, doing my work and with my, especially with my students. So I went and checked after our conversation. So there is one other physics distinguished professor who does not have a tie on in his distinguished professor. You, okay. So yeah, so you're no longer unique in that regard. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> at that time I was the only one. <laughs> but you are. I think you are essentially the only one who was where the picture was taken in front of their experimental apparatus. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so I said, so I know you had a lot of fun working with students over the years. And, and yes. And so here is this picture. I'm going to try, hang on, just excuse me a minute. I'm going to get rid of this little window thingy here. Okay. Get, I said, go over here. There we go. Okay, that'll be better. All right. So do you want to tell me what's going on in this picture? Yeah, this picture essentially, uh, as you can see, the, uh, Weber, which the student is asking us he did his work on the, on the triple uh, magnet there. Uh, he's asking us for a letter of recommendation. So uh, uh, I guess Finley had the idea of for us uh, sitting there. You can see Finley uh, looking at the picture on my left, uh, myself on the middle, and uh, and uh, you can see uh, Steve. Uh, yeah. Steve 
I think it's, uh, I don't recall, it's, it's Grimes on the, on, the other, on, the, on the right. And the, the student, whoever is trying to ask you, please write a recommendation. And so we use the idea of having three monkeys uh, on the machine there. We don't hear, we don't talk, and we don't uh, see. So do you see our, our hands covering ears, having mouths and covering eyes? Do you know the thing I find most impressive is that you all climbed up there. So, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I would not do that, but, but yeah. I appreciate the commitment to getting a good photograph. Yeah, I, I wish I could uh, climb up there. Yeah. <laughs> it was at the time, unfortunately. I don't think I can, I can do it this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then, I guess my last question is, can you tell us what the, what, what the greatest challenge you guys faced was in the, in the let's say, the early years? Uh, I'm sure we can call it for challenges. Uh, essentially, I, I'm not sure if I can really, everything that we tried to do uh, was accomplished. Uh, more, I, I remember more uh, our good time. Uh, I remember uh, getting to you in 69, and uh, if you recall, uh, people may, maybe younger than that, uh, in May uh, 1970, there was the Kent State shootings. And essentially uh, that same year, uh, the, the accelerator at uh, Wisconsin University was really uh, attempted to be put on fire by students. So uh, for two nights, we decided to guard I'm talking about 1970 to guard our building. So we, we, my my office was just facing the corner of the of the lab at that time, and essentially I stayed in my office all night long, uh, making sure that it was no no group of students coming to do any damage in our building. I also remember something very funny because in the afternoon of that day, in which the the Kent State uh, group of people uh, were really uh, put, getting together in, at Kent. Uh, my wife uh, was a student at that time from the Department of uh, Philosophy, the, I'm sorry, uh, the Psychology, and uh, uh, met a student that uh, he invited her to attend the rally at the, at the Greens. Uh, essentially, my wife said, for what rally? And he said, well, this is to attend to, to discuss nuclear physics research that's being done here at Ohio University. And so my wife, who wasn't too really keen on acronism, said uh, to him, well, essentially, uh, my, my, wife, my husband has a grant, and that grant is from the CIA. And she confused CIA with AEC. So that was really something that I would remember for the rest of my life. More challenges, really, I, I, I don't think, that we all faced challenges at the time of which we were, as I said, a student decreased from 40, 45,000 to half of it, and therefore reducing our faculty, letting go some recent faculty coming in. Those were challenging times. And as I said before, essentially, I'm really proud to be of that group of uh, faculty members that united, decided uh, to do things and let it really reduce our salary if that was necessary, but not reduce too many of our members in the faculty. Yeah, I think the, the well, even when I arrived in 2000, the, the stories of the solidarity shown by the physics department at that time was worst still very prominent on campus and it was a it was a good group to join so on yeah. a personal note i want to say that when i interviewed here in 1999 i remember you taking me down to show me the accelerator yeah and you were very gentle like you i really did not understand what was going on but you were you <laughs> you you, you, uh, you, you and i'm sure you knew i didn't get so, <laughs> when I went to your first lecture, I didn't get that much either, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and, okay. so yes. Um, 
but I will say also that uh, I talked to uh, a senior theorist who was a who, who you know who I knew, and he said, "Oh, you're going to Ohio, so Rappaport is there." He's like, "You should learn everything you can from him before he retires." <laughs> yeah. so, so I was I was glad that our paths crossed, albeit briefly. Yeah. Okay. So does so we have time for let's see maybe one or two questions. So does anyone have a question they want me to relay to Jack? No. No, no, okay. So Jack, what I'm gonna do is leave you up here so you can hear David Onley, who is the next to speak. Um, and okay. then after that, I believe there's a coffee break. Is that right? Yep, okay. So then during the coffee break, we can hand the computer around and you can talk to people. Okay, very good. All right, thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. That was <clears throat> really some excellent stories there. And Daniel, if your uh, day job as a professor doesn't work out, you could always be an interviewer. That was a very nice interview. So next we have David Onley, who was there at the beginning, as we just heard, who's going to tell us uh, some of his stories. Oh, sure, no problem. Oh, now you can hear me? Oh, thank you. Uh, because, um, all right, I'm, as you have already learned, a theoretical physicist, a theoretical nuclear physicist, uh, so I can take uh, no credit for the excellent work that's been done on this machine. Um, but I do have this qualification that I was here at the beginning and I thought I could tell you a little bit about how it all got started. When I first came here, the nuclear experimental group uh, consisted of Chuck Bryant, who you've just heard, Roger Finley, and uh, a Cockcroft Walton, that, that's, a, that's a machine, not a person. And uh, it was all, uh, the lab itself was in an old garage on Richland Avenue. As I, told, I was told it was a, um, a, a, a defunct, uh, well, I'm not quite sure it was a, uh, a defunct, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the car. It was a car dealership. Oh, Studebaker. Now that's important, of course, because that really pins it down in history. Um, now this is a, I, I suppose you can call it a group. It's really just two people. Uh, they had great ambitions, and Roger in particular had his eye on a Van de Graaff uh, from the very beginning. Uh, these uh, were held out, sort of handed out like candy by the NSF or the uh, Atomic Energy Commission. I'm never sure which. Well, the next big thing to happen was they decided to move the river. Now, 
you have to understand that uh, where we are now and where the Convo is and where Clippinger is and where the South Green is it was all floodplain. Uh, and uh, the Hocking River uh, obliged by flooding it, uh, including half the town and the roads in and out of the town and the villages around the county, uh, sometimes cutting us off entirely from the rest of the United States. So what does this have to do with nuclear physics? Um, the freeing up of the, this land, the former floodplain, meant that the university could go ahead with a lot of its uh, ambitions. And uh, one of its plans uh, was to uh, build a science complex. Uh, this was a, a start, as a start, uh, there was a, a core building, uh, which we now know as Clippinger. Uh, it has <clears throat> Two wings, uh, the original building still had, you can see them. One was for physics, the other for chemistry. You had to play nice. Uh, this was for uh, strictly for, uh, research purposes. Uh, uh, no instructional uh, facilities there at all. There was a computer lab and various important uh, 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 well, things that sort of would support the research. Uh, the, uh, there was originally supposed to be sprouting out in all directions, uh, or the other sciences, uh, uh, oh, that of course uh, didn't happen. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, of course, where was the accelerator to go? Uh, well, Roger Finley was way ahead of us on that. Uh, he already had a site picked out in the hillside, which where it now is. Uh, and you'll notice is um, actually quite a, fit, a few feet higher than the rest of the plain. Uh, so uh, conceivably, we could escape being flooded at least for the first few years. Uh, before the uh, move, uh, moving of the river was complete. So that uh, um, th that was the uh, site which uh, was large enough, uh, the building he planned was large enough to accommodate uh, the uh, <clears throat> Van der Graaff uh, accelerator, uh, which we didn't have, uh, and uh, which uh, I think many of us thought was a uh, little chance of getting. Well, the next thing was uh, the um, oh yes. Ray Lane. We hired Ray Lane. Ray Lane was a seasoned experimenter uh, from a national lab. He uh, uh, had connections and ideas. Uh, Roger Finley uh, was, of course, excited to bring him in. Uh, but in the months before he came here, he called Roger and said, why don't we go uh, for this new small tandem Van de Graaff, uh, which the, uh, I think it's the High Voltage Corporation, uh, was going to build. Uh, this was an excellent idea, would be, uh, uh, would put us out in front. And uh, in any case, uh, thrilled Roger, who went down to the building site which uh, was already well underway, and uh, had to persuade the uh, 
well, first of all, to find out whether or not this machine, for which he had the plans, would actually fit in the building. It did, just about. It was a tight fit. And uh, then uh, he had to accommodate uh, the uh, third leg. The uh, tandem uh, accelerator has this third leg, which uh, uh, houses the charging belt. Uh, that um, uh, <clears throat> in the fancier of, of, uh, uh, accelerators, it's often put into a tower, which is kind of show off. But we didn't have any space for that, but we could accommodate it by putting it in a pit. Now, the uh, floor had not yet been poured, uh, but it was due to be next, I think, following week. Uh, so uh, Roger had to convince them uh, uh, to leave a patch, you know, yea by so, uh, uh, without pouring anything so we could dig a pit there. How we managed to persuade them to do that, I don't know, because of my experience with contractors, especially uh, with state buildings, is that they won't even won't change an item. But Roger was very persuasive, and he got it done. So there we were. Uh, our building was due to uh, receive uh, this accelerator, which, uh, as I said, wasn't even built and which we'd never even ordered. Uh, but building went ahead with a, a few minor hiccups. You've heard some of them already from uh, Chuck Bryant. Uh, he didn't mention that the roof fell in. Uh, there were, uh, this is the uh, roof over the experimental uh, area, which is uh, for uh, uh, <clears throat> shielding purposes, it made of high density concrete and fairly thick. Uh, was uh, way more than the form which was they were pouring it on could stand, and the whole thing collapsed uh, onto the floor. It was a terrible mess, of course. We had to try and get the uh, concrete out before it set, which. Uh, was only partially successful. I understand, although I never saw it, that uh, to retard uh, the setting, uh, uh, they poured sugar under the... Uh, so eventually they wound up uh, by uh, jackhammering out sticky concrete. But they managed, and uh, they were the building a uh, continued pace. Of course, uh, you may wonder what happened to the old accelerator. The old accelerator was unfortunately in the path of the new river. Uh, and uh, rather hastily, I'm not sure why, because nobody had thought of this, uh, it had to be moved. It was uh, to be accommodated in a temporary a building, a, uh, it's a butler building, some a metal prefab, uh, which is usually used, I think, for uh, holding corn or something. At any rate, the, uh, the accelerator, the, uh, the uh, I can never remember, the Cockroft Walton accelerator was successfully moved, and uh, in fact, uh, the whole lab was up and running uh, in its new building, which is across the tracks from the uh, new uh, accelerator building. The tracks, mind you, you realize that the, the railroad, which uh, originally ran alongside the river, uh, had not been moved, and so uh, uh, instead uh, ran between the two accelerator buildings. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, it was just a temporary measure. And so, as you would expect, the building is still there. It's uh, harder to find now because it's uh, tucked behind the new chemistry building. Um, but uh, it, it's still occupied 
uh, uh, by the physics, by another wing of the physics department, uh, the, the uh, surface science lab. Uh, there have been several attempts to get rid of it. I, I know uh, at least uh, one president's wife thought it was a rather ugly uh, site because the, uh, the, the president's house yard goes right down the hill there and ends up uh, where the um, building is. There was nothing we could do about it. I think they painted the roof or something. Uh, I was come to think of it, uh, the um, uh, uh, ultimate uh, <coughs> solution was to move the president, which is, we've now done. <laughs> um, well, at any rate, uh, came the time uh, to uh, award uh, the next accelerator. This was uh, either the National Science Foundation or the uh, Atomic Energy Commission or a combination. Well, uh, we had this new machine. It wasn't quite finished, but it was being built. We had this building, which would it would fit into. Uh, we had a very small but uh, extremely ambitious and, and very capable uh, group of uh, scientists who would work on it. But competition was pretty steep. steep. And, but we had a few other things. Uh, one, we were in Appalachia. And at this time, uh, the, um, there was an Appalachian Regional Commission just formed by uh, the President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and uh, who should be on that commission but Vernon Alden, who is, of course, the president of the university. I'm not saying that this had any effect on anything, but uh, it obviously did. I, <laughs> uh, it was good that it was awarded to a high university and Indeed, uh, I suppose at this point, uh, I should have hand the narrative over to my experimental colleagues who already told you quite a bit. Um, since nobody's asking questions, I'll ask one for, uh, and answer it. So who was Edwards? Who was this fellow for whom the lab was named? Uh, he was a well-respected, in fact, uh, I, I believe the first distinguished professor, the one uh, to hold that title. Uh, he was an x-ray man, actually, not, not a nuclear physicist, but was well-known and well-published in the subject of x-rays. I remember uh, him because he had... Uh, a lab in Super Hall, which was the uh, main physics building, uh, with this high voltage x ray equipment, which looked for all the world like, uh, well, a, a, a Hollywood film set, you know, the kind where you have a mad professor and there are uh, columns and things that spark and so forth. I never actually saw it spark, but it, it was pretty. Uh, pretty alarming. In fact, you, you couldn't possibly be there when the uh, X-rays machine was running. And in fact, uh, John Edwards would sit outside in the hall uh, with a timer and a notebook and um, was happy to talk to anyone passing, uh, which is how I first really got to know him. I might also mention uh, that he was a master of the physics demonstration lecture, which is one of those things we all have to learn, and uh, I learned a lot from him. That's all I have to say to you, and I hope you enjoy your coffee. Mm -hmm.
All right, thank you very much, David. I think I'll never look at the ceiling of the large target room again in the same way. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, take a 20 minute break for coffee. So at 55 after the hour, we'll start again with Don Carter. Okay, very good. Okay, everyone, I uh, hope you enjoyed your uh, coffee and snacks. So. If you could please be seated again, we'll, we'll uh, resume the festivities here. So our next speaker, I am very pleased to introduce. Uh, Don Carter has been a key figure in the Accelerator Lab really over the long history, and he continues to be an indispensable member of the lab. So he'll tell us some of his memories uh, at the Accelerator Lab. Well, I have the uh, distinct honor of being the person that is at the lab still. And in 1969, I was at the lab installing the wires for the accelerator. Uh, kind of a coincidence or a fluke chance that I ever was exposed to the laboratory. Uh, it turned out that uh, when I was in eighth grade in high school, I was playing football and my coach was Bob Young, who at the time I didn't know, he was uh, employed by the physics department as an electronics technician. Um, and at our sports banquet, as I recall, we were standing around and he was uh, going to impress his uh, players with some parts that he pulled out of his pocket, which happened to be transistors and diodes, which at that time, were very new, not really popular in the consumer market, but I was an electronics enthusiast, so I had read popular electronics and some books at the library, and he asked if anybody knew what those were, and I knew what they were. I knew that <clears throat> transistors had three legs and the diodes had two, and he seemed to think that was uh, unusual, and we kind of became friends, and uh, for the next four years, he loaned me some books, and I read them. Uh, to learn more about electronics. And then finally, when I graduated in 1969, that was the year the accelerator was being installed, they needed some labor type people to come down to help with the high voltage engineering uh, technicians that were installing the machine. And the people at the lab at that time with Doug Ruth, Don Wagaman, uh, Bob Young, and so we, I went to work early in the summer uh, as a student, or not really, well, I was going to be going to OU, so we worked putting the uh, cables into the wireway that uh, High Voltage had assembled in Burlington, Massachusetts, because they had laid all these cables out and measured them for our facility, and then after they tested the machine, they put them all in boxes and they sent them to the high university so that they would be ready to install. So they needed people to help <clears throat> take all these cables, bundles of cables. I remember being, seeing stacks of them and it took us weeks uh, to just route those in the conduits and get them uh, to where they go. So we did that and then at the end of that job, we had to terminate or actually connect all those wires to the different stations that they would connect to. So that was the summer employment. And then once I started at school, um, I was hired as a student employee working for Bob. <clears throat> We were, he was designing electronics that were going to be needed by the accelerator that you maybe even couldn't buy or that he was designing at the facility. So I helped him build that equipment, um, including the radiation monitor, which by the way is still in the accelerator lab being used, the beam current integrator, which is still being used, and then some other miscellaneous electronics that so I started working with him uh, during that same time in the early 70s, uh, I remember <clears throat> they got in a multi-channel analyzer, which was a central piece of equipment that would acquire the data from the experiments. 
And I remember seeing that. It was in two big six-foot racks, and that was uh, the central part of the data acquisition system. I'm going to probably talk more about data acquisition and computers because that's what I did. Um, since uh, the main work at the lab was done by basically uh, two people most of the time, we had an accelerator engineer and my position, which was it's now called nuclear instrumentation engineer. So it's a large facility to support with two people, so we do a lot of sharing of uh, helping each other. Then after working there part-time, uh, doing repairs on the accelerator, at that time there were not many, uh, any of the maintenance that was done, a lot of it I would do. Uh, Dr. John Cox, which is a PhD student of Dr. Lane, was hired to install an IBM 1800 computer system that became available from Clippinger where they used it to map or track uh, I think it was bubble cha chamber tracks, and digitize them for analysis. That project had come to an end, so we were acquiring the uh, IBM 1800, and they hired John Cox to do that. He and I became very good friends. He was a computer enthusiast. Computers were new at the time. And so I was hired to help him um, connect the computer he was basically the system programmer, and we had the task of hooking it to, the first thing was the Nuclear Data 3300. The Nuclear Data 3300 in the early experiments, I can remember the control room, where we would take data from an experiment, or they would, I was an observer at that time, and the data would produce histograms of counts in a spectrum versus number of counts versus amplitude. And those would represent different nuclear uh, cross sections or states or yields. And to integrate those, the only output device that we had at the time was a paper tape punch, which not too many people used. Um, you could select a region and type out the data on a uh, electric typewriter and then you could add up all the counts in the peak to get the yield of that particular reaction. And at that time, you either added it up by hand or we had an old Wang calculator, not an old, but to that time it was a new Wang calculator that had a keyboard and Nixie displays and a briefcase that we set in the uh, cable tray that was the actual computation. So you could set and integrate your peaks with the Wang calculator. So that was the very early days. So one of the things we wanted to do was to interface this nuclear data 3300 multi-channel analyzer to a computer that could read the data and analyze the data. And uh, we interfaced that to various I.O. devices. And then in 1975, um, we had seen some problems with the nuclear data 3300 analyzer. It, somewhat problematic. It had many, many circuit boards that plugged in and it was all many, many wires interconnecting. It was all um, discrete components basically making up diode transistor logic. But probably two or three or four times a year we'd have to pull all the boards out and clean the contacts off with a pencil eraser. And it was getting to the point of uh, causing a lot of hassle. So since TTL integrated circuits were coming aboard, um, we decided to build a computer that would make it the analyzer part of it uh, much more intelligent. We could do data acquisition and make decisions at the time of the events as to what, what type particle it was and do routing and many other things. So we replaced the uh, nuclear data 3300 analyzer with the OU8000. Uh, we continued development of hardware and software for the OU8000. And um, one of the things, if you build your own computer, you don't have any software. <clears throat> so one of the things we did was solicit some very, very smart students. Uh, one of the first one was Dennis Hunt that worked with the OU8000. Uh, that would replace the nuclear data 3300. And that system remained the primary data acquisition system for over two decades. 
uh, all the data in the laboratory was taken by that computer and it evolved obviously over 20 years. Then the next evolution of data acquisition was uh, desktop terminals, ASCII type terminals would come in with graphics capabilities and they could be connected to the campus mainframe computers by serial data links and then there were more computers available but they were generally the machines that were on campus accessible by serial terminals. In the 80s we continued to further uh, expand the OU8000 and we expanded it so we could control the equipment in the laboratory like the swinger magnet that was installed we could remotely set the angle uh, we could uh, change the sample of an experiment remotely and we very much automated experiments to the point that one time Dr. Lane thought the experiment was so automated that he was worried that the thing would get out of control so he made me write a command halt so if things just kind of went awry he could just stop the whole thing. Then in 1982 about we designed and constructed the OU32 computer system uh, which was going to replace the IBM 1800 computer. The success of the OU8000 made us somewhat confident that we might be able to do this task so we started on that. The um, IBM 1800 uh, needed to be replaced because the maintenance support was ending and it was getting very expensive. By the way, the 1800, if I didn't mention, probably literally weighed a ton. It was the size of three refrigerators for the uh, central processing unit and disk storage and it took a room probably bigger than most bedrooms to fit it in. And a lot of software was developed for the OU32 because it was a much more powerful machine. Um, these students wrote assemblers, compilers, loaders, all the support software and the data analysis type software uh, was done by uh, Dennis Hunt, Pat Welch, and John O'Donnell uh, over a period of quite a few years, maybe five to ten. At that time, we started expanding into commercially available mini computers for uh, data analysis. We had a Unix System 5 system. Uh, Dr. Lane purchased an HP 1000A900 system, and Dr. Rappaport purchased a DEC Microvax 2 and a VacStation 3100. So we were moving on to uh, commercial computer systems in the laboratory, the different groups using different ones, especially for collaboration type work. Some people needed certain types of computers and operating systems to be able to, to work with the other people in the group. And something that's kind of interesting, uh, the early email was start, we started using in about 1987, I think, the Unix system, it would actually uh, call the computer and the computer science department uh, once or twice a day and the computer science department was calling Columbus to download uh, and transfer email uh, just a few times a day stored and forward type data transfer so we were very early in the email type work using that kind of a system uh, Possibly one of the first OU internet systems was installed in the Edwards lab about 1987 using an older Ethernet 10 base 5, which was the original, and it connected the Microvax 2 to the VAC station 3100, which was in the hallway outside the control room, and it didn't connect to the outside world, it just connected those two computers. So then around in the 1990s, we wrote all the DAQ code that we had uh, developed to run on uh, inexpensive, uh, more powerful print PCs running DOS 3.1 and then that migrated to Windows 95, then to Windows 98, so all that was ported to C. And then uh, what this allowed us to do prior to this, since we only had one data acquisition system, um, most of the time every experiment that was run had to be built and then torn down so that the next group could then build their experiment into the data acquisition system with different 
front end hardware and different analysis routines. So that was pretty time consuming uh, to do that every time. So with the PCs, we were able to um, set up multiple systems configured to that particular experimental area and they could be left in place. So that saved us a lot of time, a lot of setup uh, in getting an experiment going. Then in 94, the building was expanded, include new office and laboratory space with terminal access. Uh, that was a, a big space, needed space for the laboratory. Uh, we started seeing more collaboration experiments with other institutions outside users, such as Lawrence Livermore in Los Alamos. 2000, uh, we began again migrating the uh, data acquisition code to Linux. Uh, that was because uh, after uh, Windows 2000, at Windows 2000, uh, Microsoft did not make available the tools and they didn't make it easy to interface to the operating system, uh, to the hardware, outside hardware. So we moved off to Linux, which was becoming very popular. We're still at Linux. Uh, then we upgraded the basic data acquisition system to a distributed network system. This was used if you had multi multiple detectors. Um, it was easy for one detector to interfere with data on the other detectors, not by changing it or anything, but by influencing the rates at which the data came in. So the distributed system allowed multiple computers to be hooked to multiple detectors so that they didn't interfere each with each other. And then the high voltage belts became no longer available and we started using uh, sigling food processing belts out of necessity because we couldn't get any of the belts for the uh, accelerator. And these proved very unpredictable performance um, and the lifetime wasn't very good. These belts, the original high voltage belts, we would have to disassemble the entire vertical column pretty much once a year, which was and then install a new belt, and it would make the machine extremely dirty because with the uh, little bit of grease that came out of the dry pulley and the belt wearing, it would mix up with uh, grease and, and belt dust and become a sticky substance that got on everything, and eventually it would just make the machine start sparking, and the belt would wear out, so we would have to tear the whole thing down and clean it pretty much once a year, sometimes more often, maybe sometimes less. So we were stuck trying to use these signaling uh, belts. And we also installed some uh, yeah, computer systems for use in an undergraduate laboratory. We expanded into the undergraduate lab. In the 2010s, we upgraded the high voltage charging system to a three chain Pelotron uh, from NEC. This went very smoothly because of the hard work of our accelerator engineer, Time Devin Jacobs, and the people in the shop, Doug Schaefer. They were, this machine, this uh, process went very smoothly, and then we had upgraded to the Pelotron. The Pelotron had been considered a couple of times before to eliminate the belts, but as mentioned before in previous talks, our machine was a high, um, high intensity machine, so we needed a lot of uh, current that went up the column to keep the machine stable. And at the time that we investigated, as I recall, uh, NEC didn't think they could put three chains in and the most current they could put up was 200 microamps a chain and we needed at least 500 microamps for our machine. So we didn't do it until now, which was becoming extremely necessary and it was pursued. And they had a very good engineer came and looked at our machine and found a way to put three chains in our machine. And I think at the time it may have been the only three chain machine that they had built. That greatly improved the reliability, greatly improved the stability of the machine. Uh, no longer dirty, in fact you can go in. We've never had to, to clean the machine really since we put that in. And it runs re very reliably. Uh, I think a couple of years we went in just to see if anything was wrong. So, and that was uh, unheard of before the, the Pelotron chain. 
And we began migrating from the older systems to uh, older data acquisition systems to uh, VME-based data acquisition hardware, software from Mesitech. Uh, with these new modules, uh, you can condense what used to take rackfuls of data and dozens of cables and interconnected to form an experiment. And the, the new stuff we're using, like for um, Dr. Meisel's experiment uh, coming up, they can handle 16 detectors in a single VME card. Uh, so it's much condensed. Uh, you get rid of a lot, all, all of the front end electronics except the preamp. Uh, it's all done in, on the board through software control. And they have open source software for the MVME data acquisition code. And basically that sums up uh, what I wanted to talk about, about the evolution of the computer systems and data acquisition systems at the laboratory. And there's more information at our website in the history page. So that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Don, for sharing that, uh, that lab history. Um, I mean, I think it's clear that without your contributions, the lab would definitely not be uh, what it is today. Uh, so our next speaker is a distinguished uh, PhD from Ohio University. It is Ed, uh, Dr. Ed Sadowski. Maybe Daniel can handle the computer. <laughs> Come on up, Ed. I'm just going to try and put the logo behind you. You can do this. Well, I'm glad you didn't leave it up to me. It's not over there. How's that, Kevin? Okay. Thanks, Zach. Um, I might dispute the distinguished part uh, of that introduction. Um, so. Yeah, I graduated in uh, 88 with my PhD. I was in Ray Lane's group. Uh, and for anybody that was keeping track of the agenda, saw Paul Kohler was supposed to be here. And when uh, he had to cancel, Carl asked me, hey, you know, you want to come up and say, because I was coming anyway. He said, do you want to say some words? And I said, well, okay, sure. We're always picking up Los Alamos anyway. You know, when they... Um, Oh, and uh, so I checked. The statute of limitations on revoking PhDs is 30 years. So whatever I say here today, you can't take away my PhD. Um, and so what I want to talk about, it's going to be a little different than what you've heard so far. It's more about the skills that I learned here from these folks and how they have done well for me in uh, in my career. I'm currently a uh, division director at Savannah River National Lab. And uh, a lot of what I learned here, not, not necessarily the nuclear physics part, but the other skills, leadership, teamwork, and a couple other life skills. So let me start with the, the theorist. Um, Professor Onley was my uh, advisor when I was an undergrad here. And, uh, after taking two years of chemistry, he said, okay, you gotta decide if you're gonna be a chemist or a physicist, because the next piece is physical chemistry. And uh, so I said, no, I wanna be a physicist. But the thing where life kind of wrapped around is about 30, well, about half of the people in my division now are chemists. So that two years of chemistry is really serving me well now. So to the students, it's, well, right now you're doing your research, you got your head down, and that's everything. Be aware of the other stuff that you learn that may be helpful in the future. So don't, don't shut, don't be so focused that you miss all the other opportunities. Um, well, Professor Wright's not here, but he, uh, so, 
in one of my tutorial sessions with him, I saw uh, he had a picture of he and his wife. And uh, his wife is, was very attractive. And uh, being the red-blooded 20-year-old I was at the time, I said, wow, how do I get one of those? And, uh, and he said, well, I didn't say it quite that way, but uh, that's what I was thinking. And he said, well, he tutored, or they had a conversation hour. He was in Germany. So turns out the wife, wanted, his future wife, wanted to learn English, conversational English, and he wanted to learn conversational German. So I said, oh, tutoring. So I became a tutor, and that's how I met my wife. So again, that's to just try new experiences and see what happens. Um, Professor Grimes, he was my senior thesis advisor. Now here's, here's one that, yeah. So one Sunday night, I was in my girlfriend's dorm room, and this wasn't my wife, this was before the wife, um, and no, well, we're, we're talking, and uh, the phone rings, and uh, Professor Grimes says, oh, are you coming in for your experiment now? And I said, oh, okay, so I jumped up and went into the lab, and uh, that part was, so the lesson there is, make sure you go to group meetings, and make sure you pay attention at group meetings, <laughs> especially schedule items. Uh, let's see, oh. Dave Sturboys. So there's two things that I learned from Dave. And in the nuclear industry, this first one's really important, is uh, safety. So one day, he's showing me how to light the ion source. And he says, I'll never forget, he says, okay, look, when this thing's running, it's at 80,000 volts. So Anytime you touch anything on this, make sure you use that grounding rod first. Don't stick your finger on it first. I said, yep, okay. And that told me that in our business, it's not just radiation safety. You know, that's obviously a big thing. But there's a lot of other stuff out there that can kill you. And so follow the safety rules. And then the other one was uh, back when we would go in tanks and clean up old belts, pieces. Uh, my first tank entry, I went in with Dave, and he said, and once he figured out, ooh, this guy knows how, you know, which end of a wrench to use, he said, okay, from now on, you organize the grad students when we have a tank entry. Don't do the work, show them how to do it, and get them in there and get them out. So, okay. So, uh, that was my, one of my first lessons in leadership and organization. Plus, Dave, Dave was just a hoot to work with. Um, so Don, Don Carter, um, what, what Don taught me was, you know, you, you heard all this stuff about the, with the various computers. And that was, I, I said, oh, okay, so if you don't have a tool, go make it, because that, you know, I, all my data came on the 8,000, so, and it worked great, and it was homemade. And besides, the guy's just brilliant. Um, all right, uh, so these next two are a little bit hard because over the last 18 months, I lost the two biggest um, influences in my adult life, um, Ray Lane. And um, the biggest thing he taught me was uh, there, are, there are a lot of grad students that thought he was a jerk or, or, or he was tough, and he was. But um, if, if you could convince him, what, okay, what was your experiment going to be? What were you going to spend two weeks on the accelerator doing? And it was worthwhile, it was going to add to the level of knowledge of nuclear physics then he would, go, he would go through hell for you to get that beam time. Um, so uh, I use that now. I, I make my folks uh, 
convince me of what they're doing is worthwhile, and then I will, I will fight for them. And I learned that from Ray <laughs> many times. Um, and, and the other thing was uh, when we went off, I guess it was the 1800, I didn't even remember that, so thanks, Don. That what you heard tapes, this was just like in the old movies, you know, all the magnetic tape going around. My first experiment was the first one that was run without using those tapes as backup data storage. We just relied on the, the primary acquisition system. And so it was in a, like a lab meeting. Ray told me, he said, now make sure you tell people that, that that's, because that's a big deal here at the lab. And so what I learned from that was, don't, don't, as a boss, don't take credit for everything your people do. Give them a chance to shine and say, hey, and take ownership and say, hey, I know this is a big deal and here's why. And, then, and here's the part now about um, revocation of my degree. So uh, uh, my wife was Susie. So about, yeah, yeah, that's Jason's mom. That's my son Jason there. Oh, which by the way, before I get to Susie, um, the reason he's here is when he was four and five years old, uh, I used to pour liquid nitrogen on his sneakers <laughs> while he was in them. <laughs> that and, and uh, dust bunnies going on the floor in the control room. Oh, yeah, he loved that. And then also um, squashing pennies under the shield door. Uh, Steve tells me now we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, um, so, but with uh, Susie, and this is the part from the tutoring and being open to different experiences. Um, so, yeah, our, our first kiss was on the hill about, at about the 20 meter mark of the time of flight tunnel underneath. Not, not in the tunnel, we were on the hill above it. Um, and then one time, one Saturday night, a rare Saturday night, with no experiment going, uh, we, we kind of made out in the control room. I mean, she wanted to see it, and then, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, like I said, remember, 30 years on that. Um, so, Zach, I'll give you back a little bit of time. Thank you very much, Ed, for those excellent stories. Those were, those were really great. Our final speaker for this session is uh, Professor David Ingram, who's also the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, a longtime lab director, and general influential member over uh, Edwards Lab history. Well, on behalf of the uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy, welcome. Um, as Zach said, I'm the chair of the department, but I was also the lab director for 20 years. Um, so a lot, is, a lot of what Don Carter was describing, I, I saw him do, and it, uh, I can attest. He is a very valuable uh, member of the team that, uh, to make all this happen. And I want to thank Bob Young in particular for bringing him to us. I didn't know that, uh, that, that part of the story, but uh, Bob was, again, one of the leading people. He brought uh, many things to the, uh, the uh, Accelerator Lab, and I really appreciate uh, what, what you did, Bob. So I came here in 1989. Um, I was part of uh, a plan that uh, Lewis Wright had put together in his usual fashion of uh, making sure he got two faculty instead of just one when, the, when, the, when there was possible funding available. And I was part of uh, a, a, a team that uh, uh, was originally known as Condensed Matter and Surface Science and now has uh, morphed into uh, NQPI, the Nano Scale and Quantum Phenomenon Institute that uh, Eric Steinoff leads uh, at the moment, and uh, uh, I think that's, that's been a, a success. But uh, why did they hire me? Well, 
The idea was that low energy nuclear physics was coming to an end in 1989. Uh, they'd done it all. Everything was known. Wrong. Um, I, I did bring material science analysis, uh, materials analysis, materials modification to the lab. That was part of my job, uh, was to help other faculty uh, to use the accelerator. And I still do that today. I work with engineering faculty. Um, I'm working with people at the moment on uh, uh, photovoltaic materials that um, uh, incorporate uh, rare earth elements. Um, I'm working with uh, another faculty of uh, electrical engineering on uh, looking at how radiation damage affects uh, electronic components. Um, the technique that I use is a, an accelerator-based technique for analyzing materials that uh, was used back in the 1970s and 80s by people using accelerators similar to ours to develop new electronic materials. Uh, people at Intel and uh, Siemens and IBM and uh, those that develop uh, new uh, processes today still use this technique called Rutherford backscattering to uh, uh, develop these new uh, metallizations and so on. And again, I'm working with a faculty member at the moment. She is uh, uh, developing, in, in the chemistry department, she's developing uh, some more organic uh, electronic materials, and I'm working with her on those. So, material science did come to the accelerator lab, but nuclear physics never went away. What happened was, and there's a rather peculiar coincidence in all this, uh, in the early 90s, um, the Keck Foundation, who had funded many telescopes at that point, were looking for other things to fund. And uh, our development office uh, found this out and came to me and said, we would heard you've got a proposal for uh, putting a new facility in the accelerator lab. And uh, it turns out the Keck Foundation are interested in, uh, in funding this type of work. And so uh, we put a proposal together uh, for the Keck Foundation, and that funded uh, one of the uh, facilities that we've got still in the Accelerator Lab. Uh, it's the WM Keck Thin Film Characterization Facility, I think it was called. And that uh, became a key feature for getting other monies and so on in there for doing more material science work. But of course, the offshoot of all this is that the Keck Foundation funded all those telescopes, and guess what? Those telescopes produced lots of data. And those lots of data then became big questions for the nuclear physics community to help solve. And so we have people like Zach Meisel and Carl Bruni and others working on solving those, those problems today and providing an awful lot of the time that the accelerator is used for. So although you know, I'd been told uh, that uh, the future was in material science for this accelerator. It wasn't. So as a lab director, I was faced with having to learn a lot more about, about nuclear physics than I ever thought I was going to have to do. Um, we did bring in a lot of outside users to the uh, uh, facility, as you heard in, in Don Carter's talk, um, because for a number of years, uh, these accelerators uh, had been running in the 1970s and 80s, but the key to our accelerator was the insight that uh, uh, Roger Finley, in particular, and also Ray Lane had in the, not the energy of the accelerator itself, the energy range is a good range, but it's the intensity. How much beam current can you deliver? And that was really the key to the survival of this accelerator because it could outperform many other accelerators. In other words, we could do the work a lot faster than other people could. We could do measurements other people couldn't do. And, uh, for example, uh, OSU had an accelerator in a similar energy range, but they shut it down in the early 90s, and uh, we had people coming from OSU to this lab to use our accelerator. Their accelerator could only produce about a hundredth of the beam current that our accelerator could. And that's just an example of, of, of why this accelerator has survived so long. And uh, I expect it will survive much longer. Um, because of this, the, 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 the insight that Roger Finley and, and, as I say, Ray Lane had right at the start has helped us survive. Now, one of the other things, and you heard some of this from Don Carter, when I came, we could run one experiment at a time, and we would spend a couple of days, in my case, a couple of days, tearing down what I thought was 
fairly complicated nuclear physics experiment to do what I wanted to do, which is a relatively simple uh, measurement. And that seemed to me to be a great waste of our time. And so I was looking around constantly and with the help of other people, we found ways to get not only uh, the computers to the point where we could dedicate computers to individual experiments, but also that we had enough of the uh, digital high, uh, or the high speed electronics that we needed, uh, NIM modules to those who know about these things. We had enough of these modules around to make all this possible. Because as I say, when I came, we had uh, six beam lines. We still have six six beam lines but uh, only one or two of those beam lines could really be used. And we then started adding a lot more electronics to the point where we were able to run experiments and can still run experiments and leave them set up so that uh, uh, we can now run simultaneous experiments that are quite complicated. And that was greatly helped by the fact that the internet came along. And the internet made possible things like eBay uh, other ways of uh, discovering that people had got surplus equipment they wanted to get rid of. Um, we got uh, a lot of equipment from national labs who were shutting down their facilities. And uh, in the process, uh, I think Don, Don usually summed it up as, well, we only paid 10 cents on the dollar for that one. And that was what we were doing. Uh, we were able to bring in a lot of surplus equipment and make it possible to uh, run uh, all these experiments. We heard a little bit about the, uh, the old Neutron Lab. Um, that is uh, a wonderful building, by the way. The, um, it's a shed. Uh, that was where I and Marty Kordesh started work uh, when we first came in, in 1989. And uh, we got it uh, refurbished. And we decided to put the name outside, Surface Science Laboratory. And so we tried to get a sign made, and we were told, no, you can't do that. Only a trustee can, uh, only the trustees can name buildings. Okay. So we went to see Don Eckelman, who was the dean at the time, and explained to him that uh, we would like to name this building. And by the way, did you know that uh, Charlie Culp, the uh, facilities director, wanted to use it as a grounds building? And uh, I, think, I don't think Don Eckelman knew that he had a building down there, but uh, as usual, deans like to keep hold of buildings. And so he thought it was a good idea to name this building the Surface Science Lab. That building, it turns out, has vibrational characteristics that uh, the uh, that NIST, National Institute of Standards and Te Technology, paid about $80 million to get. And it's just because it's standing on about 70 feet of uh, uh, vibration-free uh, deposits from, from the river. And so we fought quite hard to keep that building over the years. And uh, it's still being used. You'll hear about uh, uh, us again next year. Uh, not, not the Accelerator Lab, but you'll hear about our university and uh, people from the NQPI and the Physics Department, Physics and Astronomy Department, who are running uh, these nanoscale races again. We ran one a few years ago, and uh, there'll be a team led by Sun Hui La from the, uh, uh, from the department who will re represent the US in this nanoscale uh, little robotic race. And uh, that's what can be done in a building that doesn't look very much from the outside. And uh, Charlie Ping's wife didn't, didn't really like it at the bottom of her garden but uh, it's a, a very valuable uh, thing. So I know that I'm between you and uh, cocktails, so I don't want to go on too long. Um, the, uh, I think I've probably said as much as I need to say at the moment, and uh, I think with that I'm going to call it a conclusion. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, David, and thank you to all the, the speakers of uh, this, this session today. I just want to thank all of them again, if we can give them a hand. So uh, now cocktail hour begins. It's, it's going to be back there. There's a little bar set up where we had the coffee break area. 
Um, dinner will start at around 6.30. Um, while we're having cocktails, they're going to set up the tables. So if you could kind of make space for the people, you know, setting tables and whatnot, that would be great. But uh, please enjoy the cocktails and the dinner. And tomorrow, um, well, after dinner, there's going to be a talk from Steve Grimes. And then tomorrow, we'll resume with the, the rest of the meeting. So thanks again to all the speakers today.